Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for being here. And let me begin by thanking Arthi for inviting me uh, to have a private talk with uh, 2,000 of our closest <laughs> friends. Uh, I'm really excited to be here at the RPE Summit and to, um, to join uh, a, a woman I admire and um, so excited that she's in her current position. Uh, I thought we'd start, we teach our policy students to give us their bottom line up front. So I want to ask Arthi, what's your bottom line for this audience? Bottom line up front. First of all, it is great to be here. I love this event and it's uh, great to see it continuing to gain momentum after all these years. Uh, the bottom line is, as you've just heard from Ernie and many others, there is a lot of work to do. It is critically important, and this community, the science and technology and innovation community, has the great privilege of creating pathways so that we actually achieve our goals here. And um, that's, that's a load of responsibility, but it's also, I think, the most fun and energizing work any of us could ever hope to do. Yeah, and my bottom line is that that old line you've heard about a better mousetrap is just wrong. You've got to build better mousetraps, and I know I'm speaking to a mousetrap convention. Uh, but the path to your door, you're going to have to build that too, I think. And uh, that's a big challenge, and I think a number of the previous speakers have, have illustrated that very, very well. Okay, so uh, before coming to the White House, you had a, a great job. You were your own boss. Now you have a boss. A lot of people here, I think, would like to be their own boss. So. What motivated you to uh, go back into having a boss again? Well, my boss is the President of the United States, and the first thing that motivated me is when the President asks if you'll come serve, the only appropriate answer is, when do I start? Um, but I came, with, uh, I came with the wings on because I think we are, we're at a pivotal moment. Um, we've been talking about climate and energy issues, but we're at a pivotal moment for our country and for the world. And I think this president really says it best when he talks. He says two things that I think converge into the world that we're in. Number one, that this is the moment that, that America has to prove that democracy works, that it's the better way to create a better future for our people. And that's the work I think we're all called to. But he also sees that science and technology are part of possibilities. He likes to tell the story about talking to Xi, Xi Jinping and explaining that America is the only nation that can be described in a single word, and that word is possibilities. And whenever I hear that, to me, it's a call to our community to step up to the greatest aspirations that we've got right now. And that's, that's you know, like, how do you not come do that? That's, that's what we need to be doing. That's great. Yeah, we're a nation founded on ideals, not, not on anything else. And that's what I think pulls us all, pulls us all together. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about um, what the White House agenda is particularly as it relates to entrepreneurs and innovators in energy and climate. Yeah, no, I, I think today, if you think about uh, science and technology, um, I've had the great privilege of working in the private sector for about half of my career. All of that was Silicon Valley. A lot of it was early stage venture. And then the other half is serving in different roles in federal R&D. Uh, and then for a few years, I was building a little nonprofit. But all of that, it was so many different facets of this really rich, powerful innovation system we have. This is the most powerful engine for innovation that the world has ever seen. And I love it, and I love how it works, but I, I think we also have to be really clear-eyed and understand that it was built in the, in the last century, it was aimed at last century's goals, and now we are in a different time. And it's, it's it, the, the work ahead for all of us is to aim our innovation at the aspirations that we, that we have to achieve in, in this century. And that's, it's a very big agenda. We're going to focus in on, on the climate part in particular, but I think it's important to recognize that we're doing that in a time of th growing threats in the global security environment, in a time in which we haven't yet fully achieved the American dream of access to opportunity for every single person in our country, in a time where we face health outcomes in this country that aren't acceptable. So there's a lot of work that we're going to need to do to, to live up to our ideals as a democracy. And climate, of course, is a challenge that, that over a period of time we, it, we finally come as a, as a society, as a country, as a world, to recognize how critically important this crisis is. We've made enormous progress with the Inflation Reduction Act, with the bipartisan infrastructure law, and I think we've been talking about those today. They give me such hope that we can actually start making a dent in this hard problem. 
But as everyone here knows, we've got a long, long road ahead and a lot more work to do. Uh, and, and inventing ourselves, reinventing ourselves as an innovation community to step up to that challenge. That's what I think we really all have to be focused on today. Yeah, so you were the director of DARPA, which is, of course, the original inspiration behind ARPA-E, and now we have ARPAs proliferating, and I guess they're breeding somewhere out there yeah. in the Congress. Um, what does DARPA and ARPA, the ARPA model, I guess we can call it, yeah. have to teach us about accelerating this innovation process? Right? We have, a, we have a, an innovation process that's moving to the 21st century, but it's not there yet. Yeah, and, and ARPAs are an essential part of this. Um, you know, and I think the place to start is to recognize this country does huge things. We know how to do really big things, but it happens when we do, when we all pull together, and it means, that means things have to happen in the public sector and in the private sector, universities and companies and markets matter, as well as policies, as well as practices. So you have to start, I think, with that large picture. Within this much richer innovation system, and ARPA plays a very specific role, and that is to knock down doors and make radically better things possible. Take things that, that are impossible today and get them to the point where people can, can actually imagine that, they, they, that these new approaches might work. And we, I think we tend to celebrate the technologies because they're very exciting, we're a bunch of technologists, but really the magic of the ARPA moment happens when people's minds change and, the, and, and you know, you, you get the whole rest of the world to start moving in a different direction. And I think it, that's the power and the leverage of that model. And I'll just, I'll share one story from uh, my time at DARPA that to me really crystallized it. I think you'll find lots of examples at ARPA-E. Uh, I showed up at DARPA uh, 11 years ago as director. I'd been there much earlier in my career, but I got to come back and lead the organization. And I walked in the door and one of my amazing program managers said, uh, this is 2012, he said, there will be another pandemic because all the conditions are right. He showed me that black and white, horrible picture of everyone in cots from 1918. He says, this is, you know, this is what a pandemic looks like. It's not good. And he said, we don't know how to make a vaccine that works in less than years or decades or never, but there is this new research in mRNA, and it could be the basis for a rapid response vaccine platform. Uh, and he said, I just met this little company in Boston that, called Moderna that's doing mRNA, but they're focused on cancer. We think we might, be get, we might be able to get them to focus on infectious disease. And I think that's a great example of the kind of public-private partnership. We talk, use that term a lot. But what, what, what that means is, in that case, we had a public mission. It was about preventing pandemics. They had a private mission, which was about building a company and using, harnessing this new technology. We did something together that we couldn't do separately. And the critical moment in that program came not just as we developed the technology, as we you know, put the first ever vaccines together, took it to clinical trials, but the magic moment was when we saw immune response in a human being. This is for chikungunya, this is before this pandemic. But when we showed immune response in humans, all the other minds that needed to change started changing. Biopharma companies started teaming with these smaller companies. NIH got directly engaged with Moderna. And that's why when, the, when this pandemic hit, and Moderna was able to ship doses for clinical trials 42 days after NIH developed the stabilized spike protein that, that was the target. That's, that was possible because, of the, because we made it possible in this much earlier work at DARPA. And, and so that's the point of an ARPA. You need everything else in the system. In the energy world, you need the entrepreneurship. You need the big companies. You need the huge capital. You need the policies. You need the DOE labs and the vibrant research that goes on there. You need the academic research. But an ARPA, an ARPA-E, can knit all of those pieces together and give you these leaps forward that, that create pivots for the future. And I, I see it happening already with ARPA-E, and I think there's a lot more still to be done ahead. Yeah, and of course, the big difference between DARPA and ARPA-E is in DARPA, there's a D, right? And that's a DOD, yep. a very big customer that's out there. And in ARPA-E ARPA land, we have to think about a whole variety of you customers. You always have to think about a whole variety of pathways and customers. The story I told you is not one in which DOD went and built a ship or a missile afterwards, right? I mean, a lot, about half of DARPA's success did come because the military went and built a platform, but the other half happened because it 
it mobilized what was often a commercial, sometimes a commercial and government together kind of activity. So I, I think people like to sort of imagine that, that the Pentagon is sitting there waiting for DARPA's marvels. That is not the way the world works. Uh, and, 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 but to your point, any ARPA has got to figure out what does changing the world look like? They're not going to fully do the whole thing, but you have to understand all the actors that are going to make the world change, and then you do your R&D projects in a way that creates those moments where minds change and action happens. That's the whole ballgame. Yeah, I think one of the uh, entrepreneurs who was on stage with Secretary Granholm, you know, kind of crystallized it, and he said, at some point he realized that these partnerships were not actually a distraction, but the main, the main event. And I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about the kinds of partners that companies might need who are going to come out of RPE, or there may be faculty members who are thinking about uh, starting companies. Like, how does the partner's voice, how does the customer's voice get expressed in that kind of Yeah, and I, I, I think this is an important thread, and then I want to weave it with some other threads, because I, I think we, I want to make sure we get to talking about scale, which is really the point yes. of this whole exercise. But partnerships, uh, you know, it, it's exactly what the entrepreneur was saying, is you first you start off thinking that it's about the research, then, then you think it might be about a product, but ultimately, it's going to be the starting point for so many of these technologies is actually getting into, mar into the market and finding a path to, to profits and growth. That doesn't happen just sitting isolated in your lab. And, you, you know, I, I think all of us who have, have lived in research have had this experience of, you're, you, you know, you're in the lab and you see, you can see the possibilities but that doesn't mean that anyone else can see it. And you learn so much when you go out to someone who lives in the messy real world, right? And, and it already knows how products that work, work, and understands what margin pressure looks like, and understands what their customers can and can't do, and understands what, you know, how hard it is to actually change. The, mo the most powerful technological advances are disruptive in the good way and the bad way, but they disrupt the way the world works, and so that and that's hard. And that you know that, that there's always going to be pushback, and none of that that is the real nitty gritty work of innovation. It's it's it, it it's not the purity of science where you just learn something new. It's how you actually make change happen. So uncontrolled. It's uncontrolled, but you you just have to go engage and you have to learn and iterate. So let's talk scale. So let's. How do we talk get to scale? scale? Well, so scale, I think this is the biggest challenge ahead of us because I think this, you know, this community and the broader energy research community has clearly shown that the possibilities now exist to completely transform energy for, for all of human use and to do it in a way that meets our climate needs but all of the other needs that we have as a society. So I, I don't, you know, like that, that we know can happen and we know how to start in labs, and we know more and more about how to commercialize it effectively. But I think I want to wind back to what we really need to achieve, uh, because I think it's it's exhilarating and sobering to see what, what we have ahead of us. We've just taken the biggest steps ever in the Inflation Reduction Act in deploying clean energy technologies and starting to make progress towards our climate goals. That plus the bipartisan infrastructure law and many other things that are going on have now put us on a path where I think we are within reach of the 2030 goals for, for reducing emissions. That, that is, to me, that just, it gives me such hope to know that in addition to generating new ideas that we, we know, we actually know that we can deploy and we can make this change happen. And already we're starting to see some advances, you know, in, in climate outcomes from that. And we all, everyone in this room knows that we are not done and that there's so much more work and arguably it's even harder work to get all the way to net zero emissions by 2050 and to do that not only here but, but globally. And, and, you know, and that's still the work that's ahead. And I think the thing that we want to stay, to me the key question is climate scale. What does that mean? That means a change in emissions that is so big that the climate notices. And um, I'll, I'll tell you, the, to me, a very uh, important uh, way to understand that, which is to step back and to think about, I like to think about renewables. It's the single biggest example of uh, progress on our climate goals in recent years. Renewables surged in a way that, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, no one was predicting that we would deploy renewables as rapidly as we've been able to. I think it's a tremendous success story. 
And it is still the case that renewables are abating only about 5% of greenhouse gas emissions. So think about that. Think about this is one of our biggest success stories. It's in, it, 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 you know, faster than we expected. And we're at 5%. And if we had gotten to that 5% in a decade or two, that might be okay. But the fact is, if you just take solar as an example, I think most people in this room will know that solar, the first commercial solar cells were in 1954. So 70 years from initial commercialization to the point where the climate actually notices because of the scale of deployment. So when I look at that, number one, it tells me we actually can do it. And number two, it tells me we have a problem, Houston, because we do not have 70 years to do this over and over and over again in every sector to finish decarbonization and electricity, but to decarbonize transportation and agriculture and all other land uses, industrial processes. So, you know, to me, that, that, that really draws the attention to the issue of scale. And this, I think this is a great example of the need to innovate in innovation. We have an innovation system that has gotten very good at inventing new things. It's getting better and better at getting them out of the lab and into the start of commercialization. But we don't have 70 years for that to turn into climate scale. And now I think that, to me, that is a clarion call for the kind of innovation that dramatically changes the pace of scale. And that is inherently a systems question. It is systems innovation. Part of the answer is going to be stuff that happens with chemistry and physics and biology, but a lot of the systems innovation question requires stepping back and understanding the innovations that are required, not just in technology, but in policy, in finance, in markets, and in how communities embrace and adopt these technologies and turn them into something real. And that's, that systems view is something I think, that is a muscle that I think our community has to build for us to be able to step up to the challenge of climate scale. So as we think about steps to build those muscles, um, sort of where's the locus of energy? And what can an ARPA-E do to kind of, you know, sort of have its um, ripples yep. spread out to all of these other fields that need the kind of innovation that we see here? Yeah, I think you, the way you do this is you start doing it. And I think ARPAs are, uh, you know, an ARPA-E is a perfect place to do this. And I think some of the work I see in ARPA -E is along these lines. But a lot of the methodology here is, is to you know, figure out what the future has to look like if we're going to achieve our goals. So you might, for example, pick full decarbonization of the electricity system. We're making huge strides of progress, but we also know that getting from where we are today to a fully decarbonized grid, that is, that is an amazingly complex systems problem. But if you imagine what that future looks like, and you know that it's going to require multiple sources of generation. You know it's going to have to deal with demand in new ways. You know you're going to have to think through transmission and storage in new ways. If you if start p painting that picture, going to that future, envisioning what that has to look like to decarbonize in time, and then asking the question, what would it take? How, what, what, what would it actually take to get from the life we're living now to this future that we need to be in? And when you ask that question, it drives you not just to working on a piece of the puzzle, but on, on understanding the whole system and figuring out that you, you actually have to try and innovate and experiment in all these different domains. Because we're going to, just to take the demand dimension of that, but one that um, and, and, uh, you know, a lot of people have spent a lot of time digging into, um, if you want to use the full flexibility, if you want to create the kind of flexibility and resilience in the, in the grid that allows for variable generation to be mixed with all these new forms of storage and to deal with transmission changes, everything we're going to need. Well, you know, utilities can't just go do that by themselves. Startups that are doing demand response can't just go do that by themselves. Uh, they and um, the... the um, the public utilities commissions that shape this entire environment, communities that have different usage patterns, people who are trying to get electric vehicles on the grid and figuring out how does charging work, where does it happen, what time of day does it happen. All of these pieces are going to have to come together. And I think we usually think that means let's have them sit around a table and have a nice conversation. And you have got to start there. But what I am talking about is systems innovation where you then go run experiments where all of those parties are working together. And it might involve 
trying some new method, but doing a, doing uh, actually getting out in a community and doing some experimentation. It might involve policy and pricing experiments to see what works and, and learning from those experiments and figuring out what can scale in which, which circumstances. That, that's a, it's a kind of innovation that I think is very different than our classic linear model of it starts in a white lab coat and then you start a company and then eventually you scale. That has to keep happening, but now I think we've got to think about this kind of systems innovation on top of that. Thanks. So we're going to get the hook very, very quickly. It's um, happening. But I would love it if you could rename your office the Office of Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy. <laughs> and um, we have to think, you know, exponentially and not, not linearly. Absolutely. We've got hard work to do, but uh, I know we're going to do it. So thanks, Thank you. David. Thank you for listening. Thanks, all.